All right, everyone, welcome to BitDevs LA. Uh, my name is Andrew Yang. I am your host today. And I'm excited to uh, have Nadav um, come speak and talk about Schnorr, Taproot, and potential applications that we can build on top of it, especially because it kind of got locked in recently. And um, But before we get into that, just a quick shout out to our sponsor, R River Financial. They are the best place to buy, sell, and use Bitcoin. So if you're looking for a great place to buy Bitcoin and stack sats and um, you know, DCA automatically, definitely check them out. All right, with that being said, uh, Nadav, why don't you take it away? Cool. Um, so I'm Nadav. I uh, am a software engineer at Sherfits. I uh, have spent plenty of time the past couple of years uh, doing a bunch of stuff with Schnorr and thinking about how to use it and such. Uh, and I primarily, I guess, these days uh, have been working on these things called discrete log contracts, um, which use fun signature schemes to uh, accomplish Oracle contracts on Bitcoin and all sorts of other cool things. Um, but we'll get into some of that. So I guess I will start my, I, I should say format wise, my goal is to just like run through relatively quickly. You'll have questions. Um, uh, about the things I say, but I will like keep going and then we will hit the end and then we will have a discussion and people will ask questions and then we'll go talk about whatever it is we're interested in talking about. That way uh, you guys get to decide what's interesting and I'm not deciding what's interesting to us. So there's plenty to talk about, so let's get started. Um, so Schnorr signatures, uh, which are going to be a part of Taproot, which has just been locked in and will be activated on Bitcoin in November, uh, are a better elliptic curve digital signature. Uh, they're faster, they're smaller, they are easier to validate that they are indeed secure. They have a better security proof, is maybe the more technical way of putting that. Uh, and they're more algebraic, which means we can do more things with them. Um, Taproot as a whole, includes Schnorr signatures, and also these two other pieces, which are uh, scripts, are now going to be uh, kind of broken up into pieces where you only have to reveal the bare minimum in order to actually spend your coins. You don't have to reveal your entire contract, your entire script, all possible way, ways in which these coins could be spent in order to spend coins. You now only have to reveal the specific path you took um, and that uses Merkle trees. So scripts are now going to become uh, smaller, more efficient. You can have much, much larger scripts because you don't have to reveal the entire thing. So we have lots of cool stuff there. And then the third piece, confusingly called taproot or tap tweak, um, is that uh, the public key spend and script spend paths that are kind of traditional to Bitcoin. You know, we have pay to pub key, pay to script hash, pay to witness pub key, pay to witness script hash. Now in taproot, it's just pay to taproot uh, address. It's not uh, separate things for pub keys and script hashes because they actually look the same. Uh, and that's what this taproot thing is, is it uh, makes it so that uh, there's always like this everyone cooperates branch, which is indistinguishable from just normal single pub key spends. Um, and then only in cases where that can't be used, then you do a bit extra at spend time. Um, the first big benefit, I'm going to talk more about Schnorr signatures for the next bit, um, or I guess I'll primarily focus on them because they're the part I find most exciting. Um, we have batch verification, which essentially just means you don't, you can verify many Schnorr signatures at once much faster than you can verify each one individually. So if you're doing something like an initial block download, syncing your node in the future, uh, all of these Schnorr signatures are going to be validated much, much faster. And that isn't just for initial block download, it's also, you know, if off-chain things are using Schnorr signatures, and, you know, side chains are using Schnorr signatures, you can kind of batch all of these things together and do faster validation. Uh, and the next cool thing we have is called MuSig, which is a key aggregation scheme. So essentially, uh, unlike with ECDSA, we can relatively simply aggregate keys uh, for, for Schnorr, public keys and signatures. And then uh, essentially you can think of this as say you have two people, they add their public keys together in some 
not too special way. Um, and then they each generate their own signatures and you can literally add these two signatures together to get a valid signature for the sum of their keys. So you can essentially hide the fact that it's a two of two uh, and just have everything on chain look like a single public key. So this includes things like lightning channels, discrete log contracts, and any other N of N party channel, and even some more than that. But you can essentially take all of these multi-party schemes and uh, take all of the multi-party logic off-chain, and on-chain, you just have a single pub key, single signature. Uh, it's good for privacy, it's good for scaling and fees, it's good for everything. You don't want to be using blockchains when you don't have to be. Um, and then paired with Taproot, uh, which lets you, as I mentioned, Taproot, the upgrade, not the sub piece of the upgrade, uh, lets you have multiple conditions. You can even take uh, more interesting threshold combinations of keys. So you can imagine if I wanted to do a two of three multi-sig for say my cold storage or something like this, then I could do, say if my keys are A, B, and C, I could do a mu-sig of A, B, A, C, and B, C, and then have those be three separate script conditions. And then at the end of the day, on chain, everything looks like a single pub key or uh, script spend with a single pub key. Um, so music kind of and key aggregation uh, essentially lets us hide all these complex things and do them off chain instead of on chain, which is always not using a blockchain is always good for privacy and for scalability and fees. So that'll be great. Music is big. Another thing, I won't spend too much time on this probably, but Schnorr admits a relatively decent blind signature scheme, which means you can have schemes where um, servers are signing transactions in a way, kind of blindly, in a way that when you unblind their signatures and put them on chain, uh, they cannot actually recognize which signature on chain is theirs or that that particular signature is theirs. Um, so essentially it lets you do interesting things like partially blind coin swap servers. So a coin swap is where uh, two parties atomically swap, say the same amount or nearly the same amount of Bitcoin um, in a way that those two transactions aren't linked on chain, but they are linked crypto cryptographically off chain. And so you can have servers that are just facilitating doing a bunch of coin swaps with people in a way where the server itself cannot tell, cannot like correlate the coins it's getting in with the coins it's sending out because it's using blind signatures. So that's a really cool application I'm looking forward to seeing out in the wild someday. Um, it'll be cool for privacy and yeah. Um, another thing that we can do with Schnorr signatures is threshold signatures. So this is similar to what I said earlier. Music, it's a kind of key aggregation, but here rather than it just being like adding these n keys together and then you know you have n signatures that you need to generate uh, the kind of aggregate signature. With threshold signing, it's kind of what we in Bitcoin call multi-sig, which is confusing because that's multi-sig means things like mu-sig in the cryptography literature and things like multi-sig are called threshold signatures in the cryptography literature. So threshold signatures are these M of N or T of N schemes where you could have a two of three or a three of five signer scheme uh, where it, as, in, as is in music, you have a single pub key that goes on chain or single pub key that you're using and a single Schnorr signature uh, that can be generated by any three of these five people, or things like this. Uh, but of course, only those five people know that and everyone else in the world can't distinguish between these threshold pub keys and threshold signatures and normal Schnorr pub keys and Schnorr signatures. Um, and this is really cool in lots of ways, including the fact that it's kind of composable. So you could pretend that you have like this one pub key, but actually you're doing like more interesting key management and someone in order to steal your private keys would actually have to steal like two of your three private keys in different locations or something. And then those two of three are making up a single piece or one side of like a lightning channel. And so now we can have more interesting, more secure lightning channels and, and all sorts of other schemes. Uh, so especially this is really interesting for any kind of 
hot wallet applications like Lightning, like, um, I mean, this is something exchanges already do. Uh, oftentimes with their hot wallets is they have these threshold signature schemes. Uh, Schnorr's threshold signature scheme is infinitely nicer than ECDSA. So it's not that ECDSA doesn't have one. It's just that, like, I think it has at least seven rounds. And it's super complicated and tricky to get right, and there's a huge attack surface in comparison. Whereas in um, Schnorr, it's uh, one to three rounds, depending on the con text in the setup and it's faster and it's uh, simpler, easier to get right. Um, and hopefully that also means more available to more people and not just like exchanges who have the ability to implement these things. Um, and so this also means we'll be getting things like secret sharing coming to Bitcoin software. Uh, this is not really Schnorr specific, but it's kind of like because we're getting Schnorr, people are prioritizing things like threshold signatures on Schnorr, which requires secret sharing, and so Bitcoin will be getting secret sharing in its cryptography libraries. So this is kind of just like a side benefit. Um, Jesse Posner is uh, an open source dev who is working on implementing uh, Schnorr threshold signatures, and the first step is to implement secret sharing. So that'll be exciting. For those who don't know, secret sharing is essentially uh, kind of this threshold scheme for private keys, like no signatures involved, but just like for keys and key management. So this is if you wanted to have like a single public key on chain and, uh, you know, instead of just using like one cold storage device, some people these days use like multi-sig and they have like two of three that they need. Uh, but then that has a footprint on chain and it has various other trade-offs to consider. And so secret sharing is kind of this alternative where it looks on chain like a normal thing, um, but really you still have three separate devices and you need two of them or whatever other threshold scheme you want. Um, and then lastly, really quick, wanted to mention proactive secret sharing. You can actually rotate out these shares. So it's not just that someone has to steal two of your three private keys or three of your five private keys. They have to have them all at the same time because you essentially like rotate all of the shares in this kind of interactive scheme where um, essentially the only way that they're going to be able to reconstruct your private key, they can't like hack into one of your computers and then leave and hack into another and then leave and then hack into another because like these things are changing. So they need to have like at the same time or within some time interval, um, all of those things. So that's another cool thing that I've heard Jesse say he might work on, so I figured I'd mention it. Um, and then my favorite of all of the Schnorr signature variants is adapter signatures, um, which are also known as scriptless scripts. I'm missing one of the quotes there, sorry. Um, and they're also known more recently as one-time verifiably encrypted signatures, which is way more daunting of a name, but it is, I guess, technically more precise. Um, and yeah. But we, we can get into what those are, but essentially, at a high level, uh, they allow you to have these things called point blocks, which are very much the same as hash locks for people who are familiar with things like HTLCs, that's a hash time lock contract, which has one side a hash lock, and a hash lock is essentially just a Bitcoin contract where it's like, you can claim these coins if you reveal the pre-image to a hash to me, so this secret to me. And so a point lock is another pay for secret scheme, but rather than the pre-image to a hash, it's the scalar to a point, which you can think of as being like the private key to a public key, or uh, more. Re I think normally how it is, is it's the decryption key to an encryption key. Um, but regardless, same math, same stuff happening under the hood, regardless of how you put it those ways, if any one of those made sense to you, then just stick with that. Um, but essentially what a point lock lets you do is it lets you do all the same stuff that you can do with a hash lock and much more. So uh, you can also, or it has the added benefit that uh, since it's happening in the signature with some fancy cryptography, uh, none of it is actually on-chain. On-chain you don't see anything. You can't see that a point lock was used. Um, and so it's better than a hash lock in that way because with a hash lock you actually have to put a hash on-chain and be like, give me the pre-image. Um, as opposed to doing something more implicit off-chain, which is what adapter signatures are. So that's one benefit, which means things like coin swaps really don't make sense with hash locks, right? I could have a hash lock to you saying, uh, I will pay you the, 
this amount if you reveal the hash preimage to this hash, and then you set the same hash to me for the same amount in a different place, then I was the person who generated all of this. I know the hash preimage. Uh, I claim your coins, which allows you to claim mine. The reason this doesn't work is we've literally just correlated these two payments with a hash on chain, but with point locks, there's nothing on chain. It just is a transaction over here and a transaction over there, and no one is going to be able to link those two things uh, very easily. Um, so that's what a point lock is. Uh, you know, HTLCs are the basis for routing on the Lightning Network. We want to replace those with PTLCs uh, because on top of the off-chain benefits, you also have the benefit that um, you can do things with points. You can add them together, you can tweak them, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, and those additions and tweaks correspond to the same additions and tweaks of the pre-image of the secret. Whereas with hashes, if you add two hashes together, now you just have garbage. Um, so hashes essentially destroy much more information than points, but points still destroy enough information. So we get PTLCs on Lightning, which lets us do all sorts of things. We'll get into that. Uh, we have coin swaps, like I mentioned. And adapter signatures allow you to do things like discrete log contracts, which is the stuff I work on, where you can make uh, certain point locks that correspond to like Oracle signatures of real life events and things like that, which lets you create contract logic uh, that is entirely hidden. It's not on chain. But essentially, using just signatures, you can enforce pretty arbitrary uh, Oracle contracts on Bitcoin, which is super cool. Uh, I will note, uh, like most of these things, it's not that you can't do it with ECDSA, it's that it's not really practical to do it with ECDSA. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's, solve it's like good in a math sense, or it's like, okay, this is a solved problem in some sense. We know how to do it, but it's not something that necessarily then translates into like practice in like open source Bitcoin world because it's just super complicated. That said, adapter signatures, we have like a weak version of them working pretty simply and well with ECDSA, and that's how we do DLCs on chain today. But everything will, of course, be better once we have Schnorr. It'll be like three times smaller, at least two times faster, and um, simpler in every way. So that'll be exciting. Uh, going back to, well, how is this going to affect Lightning? Well, there's a couple kind of details about how Taproot is going to improve Lightning channels, but that stuff is still pretty much in flux. The stuff I do know about is what you can do with point locks instead of hash locks on Lightning. So the first thing you get is we can decorrelate payments, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, with coin swaps, you can't really use hash locks because it's not very private. Well, right now, we kind of do something like that on Lightning, where when you're routing a payment, Alice to Bob to Carol to Dave, they all use the same hash in their hash locks. Uh, so if, say, um, Dave and Bob are the same person, then they will be able to know that this is actually the same payment because they're all linked. They're all correlated with this payment hash. With PTLCs on Lightning, there's just going to be, we're going to add a tweak at every hop. So that gets rid of that problem. Easy. Uh, if it was just that, it would still be worth it to do. Uh, it gets rid of things like wormhole attacks and other annoying things. Um, but that aside, we also get all sorts of other cool things. Um, first of all, you have an actual proof of payment in the sense that since we have these tweaks at every hop, now on our Lightning payment routes, um, only one person learns like the actual pre-image to the invoice to point, as opposed to everyone along the route learning it. So you can actually use it in your application logic by itself as a proof of payment. These days, I've talked to quite a few people about how they use proof of payment over Lightning. You have to use it in conjunction with some additional pub key information. Uh, in order to ensure that it is actually the payer and not just like some routing node. Um, maybe it's not a big deal in a lot of contexts, but it does for some applications matter. Um, and some in particular are atomic multipath payments, uh, which we have today on, I think, LND at the very least, maybe on one or two other implementations as well. Um, you cannot invoice an atomic multipath payment because everything has to be generated by the payer. But with PTLCs, you can add things together. So you take the stuff that was generated by the payer, 
and you add a thing that was generated by the vendor, and then that can act as a proof of payment. So kind of TLDR, PTLCs reintroduced proof of payment to all the places where we've kind of compromised it for cool functionality, like AMPs and uh, stuckless payments, which can be better thought of as like, you can retry a bunch of payments uh, until one succeeds without risking all of them going through. Only one of them will go through. So it kind of makes the UX better once we'll have that. Uh, other cool things you can do, you can trustlessly pay for Schnorr signatures over Lightning. So that's really great for stuff I work on because you can buy like Oracle signatures over Lightning uh, without having to trust that like the pre-image to the secret is going to be the right thing. You can actually do some math and have it be verifiable. Uh, you can have uh, more interesting payments where it's not just like you can claim this payment, but it's like if you can get two of these five people to sign off on this payment, then this payment will go through, which lets you do all sorts of cool like escrow and Oracle and other interesting kinds of contract logic just on normal lightning payments. And again, this is just indistinguishable to everyone else from just normal lightning payments. So points are really just much more expressive than hashes. Um, and with those things, I've figured out how you can do cool stuff like atomic multi-payment setup and atomic multi-payment transfer and other interesting routed lightning contracts, like hopefully DLCs on lightning someday. Um, so lots of things you can do with PTLCs on Lightning. Um, that's the intro to that. I've written like an eight-part blog series on that. If people are curious beyond what I can answer today, uh, I'll link to that, I think, at the end. Uh, one more application I wanted to mention just to kind of give people a feel for how not just Schnorr, but like the other Taproot stuff is going to improve things. So the most common, I think, like simple escrow contracts that people actually use in the wild is just a two of three multisig where like the common example is like two friends want to make a bet on something uh, and then they have like some third friend they both trust and then they you know put say a bitcoin each into some place and then uh, into specifically a two of three multisig where either they can agree or if they disagree Either one of them can go to their arbiter friend, their escrow friend, and uh, whoever that friend sides with will get the, uh, the Bitcoin. Um, and how this will look in uh, a post-taproot world is uh, you don't even have to like discuss this with your trusted third friend to begin with. You just like have their public key. You don't have to actually involve them in the construction here. And what you do is you have the taproot, the uh, everybody agrees case, just be a music or an aggregate key between you and your friend who you're making a bet with. And now if you guys agree on uh, what the outcome should be, then you and your friend will just each generate your signatures, add them together, and that will let you spend the coins to however they're supposed to go. Um, and if only if you disagree do you actually reveal that there is a script and reveal specifically just a single spend with either me and our third friend or you and our third friend, uh, which that will also be an aggregated key. So kind of the happy path, the most likely, most common path is just it looks on chain the same as any other single transaction, single public key Bitcoin spend. Uh, and then in the worst case, it looks like a slightly weirder, <laughs> but still very normal looking single pub key spend that uses a script path to just spend a single pub key. Um, and this is kind of what all contracts on Bitcoin are going to start looking like, or at least most contracts on Bitcoin are going to look like this, where either they're just like single pub keys on chain, or at the very worst, there's like a script reveal that needs to be used and then at the end of that you reveal the actual spending condition which is usually either just a single pub key or like a lock time in a pub key or something like this. So that is kind of what contracts are going to look like with Taproot and I believe basically everything I just talked about I've written blogs about at sharedbits.com slash blog so uh, if I am not able to answer your question today hopefully there is something in there um, that 
does. But that is my run through, and I am going to stick around and we can talk more in depth about anything that we want to. Yeah, thanks, Nadav. Uh, that was pretty, that was a great, like, I think, overview of things that people can do with Schnorr and Taproot and stuff. And, like, for me, it's, like, super exciting because we just locked it in, you know, like a month ago or a couple weeks ago. And so I, what I'm hearing from other developers in this space is just, like, there's a lot of excitement about, like, the types of stuff that, like, you can start building now that we have Taproot. Um, and so it's cool to kind of see you give, like, a brief overview and layout of, like, the different things that you can do. But, yeah, I want to open it up to the group. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Nadav about um, maybe some applications you guys can potentially think of now that he's kind of broken down some of the things that you can do with Taproot or if you guys need any like clarification questions about some of the stuff he talked about um, I think it would be a really good time for us to just kind of like brainstorm and stuff um, I have a question um, um, it, it was my understanding that or uh, I guess I might be out of date on this it was my understanding that some uh, some um, functionality was being enabled with Taproot but we were going to need a soft fork like way in the future to like to like do a bunch of other things um, what do we get now and what do we get later <laughs> yeah good question so everything I just discussed we all we get all that now um, and there are other things and I'm sure there are even things I didn't discuss that we also get now but uh, the big thing that kind of schnorr is a step towards but not all the way or we're not all the way there we need like further soft forking for is called cross input signature aggregation so essentially, Schnorr allows you to aggregate signatures. Uh, and what that means practically for us here is you can take like a musig and you know have like a two of two turn into just a single pub key. Now in theory, what that means is you should be able to like just combine all of the different signatures in a given transaction into just like one signature across inputs. So cross input signature aggregation. Um, but that's not currently something that would work in Bitcoin without a soft fork. There's kind of a lot more to it than that. Like the cryptography, just the ability to add signatures together isn't the end of the story, like in order to make it work with kind of the UTXO model. Um, but the kind of end goal is for that to be essentially what happens, is that across all inputs on a given transaction, all those signatures get aggregated together and kind of the coolest thing about that aside from it just like saving a massive amount of chain space because most of the chain space is like the spending of utxos the utxos themselves are only like 32 bytes uh ish um but uh yeah so for these spendings if now you can add up all of the signatures on a given transaction and add them together, that really incentivizes batching and things like coin joins for normal spending activity or everyone, essentially anything you do, you're gonna wanna get in some larger transaction with a bunch of other people so that you don't have to pay as much or almost very much at all in terms of on-chain fees. So that is kind of like this big thing we're hoping uh, to, to work towards. Uh, and this is a big first step in that direction is adding a signature scheme that actually lets you pretty simply add signatures together. I was wondering about, so this application you talked about at the end about, um, say, a sort of an escrow application. So say you had a distributed exchange and you've got two people swapping, or like one person paying another person, and then if, if they don't agree on the payment being, or the trade being made, for instance, you would have an escrow agent that would step in. Um, and you mentioned that the escrow agent wouldn't necessarily have to be aware of the transaction, of course, unless they had to arbitrate it. Um, but do you, by that, do you mean that they would just have like potentially a public key or like a well-known public key out there or a tweaked version of it or something that would go into that initial transaction? Yeah, so there's a well-known public key or just a known public key, I guess. You could like just go get one over Tor like, mm -hmm. you know, ad hoc. Uh, right. But yes, and then you would tweak that key so that it's not actually noticeable anywhere uh, unless okay. it's used. And then you can even try and like do some extra blinding things. But at that point, maybe <laughs> you know we we can go to the the whiteboard for that one. But um, yeah, essentially that's what you do is you uh, take a tweaked version of a known public key and you use that 
uh, to do stuff. Um, if you're interested in this use case, which or in this kind of setup, which I personally find like super interesting, and it'll probably be the next thing after DLCs in kind of my line of work. Um, the write-up to go find is, uh, I can type it in chat as well, but I'll say it as well for the video. Uh, it's called Smart Contracts Unchained. It's uh, ZMN SCP XJ um, write-up from a while ago. And it, it doesn't like go through all the conclusions of kind of the construction. There's like a bunch, I think, that you can read between the lines. It's a pretty short write-up. It's like... Uh, one monitor or something worth. Um, but uh, it kind of describes how to do it very broadly, even before Taproot was around, and then it has a note about, like, when you have Taproot, this looks pretty trivial and is really nice. Um, I guess at the end, it's still going to look like at the end, even if it's the arbiter doing the second signature of this two of three, for instance, it's still combined with your public key and your signature. Or your, it's still combined with your signature in the end, so... That's right. And the cool thing about so Smart Contracts Unchained actually goes into some detail about how you commit to the contracts that the escrow will then be an arbiter of. And you can commit to like arbitrary and even encode contracts. Like you could commit to some Java or Rust. Rust would be better because of deterministic builds. Uh, contract um, that uh, like some subset or DSL or something um, that like given some inputs, say like tweaked oracle signatures or something, uh, spits out some outputs after some extensive computation, and then this would be a way to do some pretty arbitrary computation without having to do anything on chain. Um, and then, you know, in cases of dispute, you then go reveal like the tweak, and then it's like, oh, it's your key and this tweak. And then, you know, they can check that all this stuff has been signed correctly and they validate kind of, or they run the program. It's kind of like a pay for compute kind of escrow model. Though you can do, you know, your more standard like manual, uh, like unchained capital version of just two of three, you know, humans are involved. Would that tweet be the output of that executed program sort of thing? Or that... It would be like the hash of the Rust code. Or the hash of that, like that. Uh, yeah. I see. Something like that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I've I've always been interested in that escrow application, especially in the distributed exchange area. And I think yeah, it sounds like it's completely a new game with with Taproot. <laughs> so totally. It's, yeah. No, it's super. super exciting. Exciting. Especially yeah. with PTLCs on Lightning, you can also s create specific points that essentially have the logic of like buyer and seller or seller and escrow or something like that, mm -hmm. where like any combination there can uh, come together and compute the decryption key needed in order to claim the lightning payment. Oh, uh, that's interesting. So sort of a, a escrowed lightning payment, is that kind of what we're talking about? Yep, exactly. And then you can have <laughs> multiple of those set up in certain ways so that like you can have really complex multi-possible payout logic um, depending on anything. Wow. And I, and I guess, and then just for icing on the cake, it would still look like a single signature, single... Yeah, it looks thread. like a normal lightning anything. Like it, it requires nothing yeah. from the routing nodes. It's just yeah. the end nodes need to know about the math they're doing. Right. They kind of have to negotiate out of band, but then once they've done the negotiation and calculated their signatures together, they just add that and done. So, yeah, yeah it's a... I see. So yeah, and that's you know that's a big power of Taproot that you were saying that they don't look like Taproot opens and closes. They just look like potentially a different. I mean, I guess for just a happy pay, happy path, they don't look like anything unique. Potentially, right. and with Lightning, they image. don't even like they're not even there, right? Like it's, it'll never yeah. be on the blockchain. Right. It's oh. just entirely yeah. peer to peer. Uh, no one needs to know the contract except for these two people. And even when the contract is being quote unquote disputed, that's still just like encryption key stuff off chain. And the only thing right. on chain or with other intermediate routing nodes or anything, the only thing they see is just a normal lightning payment, either failing or succeeding. Right, right, that's amazing. Yeah, great for privacy, great for functionality. Yep, and that's why they call them scriptless scripts. It's because <laughs> essentially you're like writing out a bunch of scripts, but there's no script. <laughs> Right, the script's all off chain, I guess, or the 
Yeah, it's all in the cryptography yeah. kind of construction. Yeah. And then I guess the only difference for Lightning is you're just you're doing it with your updates as opposed to doing it with your I mean like it's it's off chain updates to transactions that Yeah, it doesn't require on chain settlement of any kind, even to move funds around in unless there's some kind of dispute. And did you mention let's see this uh I guess, okay, so I'm oh, sorry, I was thinking something else. I guess eventually there's going to be something like potentially L2, which will allow less metadata to be saved intermediate on those things, but that's a different topic. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, this just gives us a lot more privacy and a lot more efficiency on chain because the scripts are so much smaller and the signatures are smaller. So. Yeah, and it's like it, it will pair fine, and it will pair well with L2, but it does not. Sadly, right. give us L2 channels quite Right, yet. but it gives us a whole lot of stuff until then. Yep. Yeah, yeah and uh, you know, L2 channels, I hope, will be PTLC based mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and yeah, it seems like it's definitely right up your alley too on the hash and the um, the contract stuff. The um, Oracle. So I guess in this case too, like you're saying, the Oracle. Yeah, all the Oracle stuff is essentially just cleverly constructed point locks. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this gives us point locks, which turns out also gives us, with some other extra work uh, on, like, the DLC spec, gives us just Oracle locks, which, like, points mm -hmm. are composable with other things. You know, you can, like, be like, uh, Oracle says this, and escrow says this, and seller claims this, or buyer and escrow and this other oracle said this thing or like two of three oracles said this thing or you know you can do all sorts of stuff it's just a bunch of wow. uh, and, it all gets, math. and it all gets sort of added up into one signature in the end and that's all the see on the blockchain yeah wow so do you think people are looking at the like for your oracle application is the idea something like futures contracts, you know, blockchain, or, you know, <laughs> hash rate contracts, or, you know, yeah, like I, I, there, I've heard lots of ideas. The, the one big thing that I think is actually, like, essentially in prod and in a closed beta, I think, at this point, is Atomic Finance has a DLC-based covered calls market uh, okay. for kind of yield strategies. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to call them that, but yeah, there's it will yeah. certainly have all sorts of kind of more financialized applications, um, future you know derivatives essentially, mm -hmm. um, and then you know there's also you can do prediction markets, you can do all sorts of weird stuff, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then you you can also do like synthetic assets, especially once we put DLCs inside of Lightning channels and and make things much faster. You can use things like contracts for difference uh, on like some piece of collateral iteratively in order to have simulate some other asset inside of Bitcoin lightning channels. Um, wow. Yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff. Like it's, it's cool that it's like, we're, it's like all these building blocks and we'll at some point, you know, hopefully over the next decade or whatever, like be building up on top of all of these things that we finally have nice little building blocks for. I've I've heard some other communities like to call them Legos, but um, yeah. ours are all off chain. So, <laughs> well, and they're they're not just more private this way, but they're also atomic, right? You're not trusting and it necessarily. Scales. <laughs> and it's okay. Scale scales. What do you mean? In which way? Just the fact that they're uh, smaller, or the fact that you don't have to use a blockchain? <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, are because off -chain, right? Yeah, yeah. That's I see. generally speaking. Uh, the two ways to scale a blockchain are to not use them, or um, yeah, no, that's about like, the the best way. The only way to scale a blockchain is to yeah. not use it. <laughs> yeah, well, basically to use it for the only thing it absolutely needs to be used for, which is that's the right. final settlement part of it, not the. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. No, there's another way. So you can either not use it very much, or you can centralize it, certain parts of its control. Those are like the two ways, because if you make super huge blocks and have them come every five seconds, uh, then you, you'll have like five full nodes, and they'll all be on your AWS, <laughs> and like everything else will be fine. But <laughs> yes. Um, yes. yeah, so that's the other way to scale things is centralization. So if we want actual decentralized finance, decentralized everything, uh, we're going to have to use clever cryptography, and it'll be 
it'll it'll be the way to go. And the cool thing is like none of this work that I've been doing or mentioned in any of those slides, like you can do that on anything. Like I hope at some point people doing all their fun cross-chain atomic swaps will be using PTLCs instead of HTLCs and all all sorts of other things like that. Like most blockchain applications don't require that you use a blockchain for very much. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're trying to make that much easier and kind of in these nice, you know, APIs and packages that people can then actually use. Because, you know, the downside is it is more complicated to do things this way, um, which is why it's taken longer. Right. But I guess, like you said, the smart signatures are easier to validate, so I assume the rest of the math is easier to validate, so that gives yeah, you some it's, confidence. It's, it's especially just the fact that, like, uh, or, or yes, so it's, it's, it's all simpler and um, essentially ECDSA is like you take Schnorr and then you like make it worse. But since it's like actually verifiably worse, like you're not infringing on patents because it's not mm -hmm. that thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But it also means it's worse. So yeah, <laughs> Schnorr is just better. And uh, so for context, uh, Schnorr for a very long time, Schnorr signatures were patented by a man whose last name is Schnorr. And mm -hmm. um, so that is why, uh, that's not actually, so they were in the public domain by the time Bitcoin was being created, but I don't believe that they were, uh, were any really well-tested open source implementations and Satoshi just used OpenSSL. So mm -hmm. we got not only ECDSA instead of Schnorr, but also a bunch of unnecessary serialization details and design mm -hmm. decisions that are just negatives and that we're getting rid of. Now that we're introducing our own Bitcoin specific signature, we don't have all of the weirdness around um, trying to be more general than what is used in Bitcoin. Yeah. He, he chose time to market instead of something that That's wasn't right. ready yet. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, it's great to see like, that getting fixed. Yeah, like batch verification is not a Schnorr specific thing. That's like a serialization specific thing. <laughs> We're like, oh, interesting. You, you, we could have had nicer ECDSA signatures and uh, then. Oh, it's, it's related to the serialization in the blocks, you mean? Like how they. Or, 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 yeah, like essentially, like what information is in them. Because there, there are a couple different ways to like have equivalent signatures, essentially, uh, whether you present like the capital R in the S. Or instead present the E and the E. Or I might be getting this wrong, but there are like two things, and you can like compute the third from the other two. Um, okay. And which one you choose affects various things. I don't know if that's. Actually, I forget if this is actually the one that has to do with batch verification, but I remember Peter will uh, telling people that um, it we could do batch verification with ECDSA. We would just have to like okay. change some details. Um, which do, do you know? Or are people working on PRs for the batch verification now? I mean, is that something? Uh, it's been implemented. Oh, I okay. believe it got separated out from the initial merge, though, before that initial stuff got merged, just because like they wanted mm. to keep it nice and small. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Jonas Nick has implemented batch verification, and you know they ran benchmarks and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know what the current state of where that code lives is. If it's probably on a feature branch somewhere. I don't mm -hmm. know what the merging plans are. It might end up just being merged in... No, it'll, it'll end up being merged in SecP 256k1 proper because the current definition of what goes in there is the things Bitcoin Core uses. Um, whereas mm -hmm. like other things, like adapter signatures, will probably go in a, a fork of that library called SecP 256k1 zkp, um, where a lot of other development happens. But yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's been done. I don't think it has made it through like as through a review process as they wanted before merging. It mm -hmm. got delayed a bit. I don't know what the current state of it is, but it's like done in some sense. Like you could okay. do it if you so wanted. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's but I, I assume that it would be considered a consensus change. Is that right or not? Like, or because it's just, I mean, it's how it's you not validate. Okay. Maybe someone would disagree with me on that, but it, <laughs> it's just a, 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 yeah, it's a batch call to right. stuff you're already doing. I guess the rules, the rules are more or less the same. It's just kind of giving another way to solve those problems. That's right. Yeah, and we we introduce optimizations into SecP all the time when we find them. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that that will be a point of contention, or at least I hope not. It's exciting. Exactly. It was. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's obviously just talking about uh, efficiency. That's going to be a big one. So totally. But yeah, all of this. I mean, I, everything you just talked about is going to be a huge efficiency yeah. gain. Of course, I guess the long pole in the tent here is getting all the clients updated and all the service providers updated, and that's yeah. that's a bit of a longer road. All the libraries that they depend on. Yeah, and getting probably some additional like non-BIP, like higher level specifications and standards for constructing um, taproot scripts and things like that. Um, like, you know, if, for example, if you're doing a multi-sig cold storage, these days on-chain with multi-sig, like off-check multi-sig, you need to keep track of, like, your pub keys, or, like, is it the order of them? Or, ah, I forget. You know, like, there's some extra yeah. metadata you need, and there's uh, more of that now that there's less on-chain. <laughs> um, when it comes right. to Schnorr, so there, there, there are still just engineering, like normal software engineering problems to be worked out. Um, not so that, remind, that reminds me. How does this relate to something like Miniscript and output descriptors? Is that like an update to Miniscript? I assume. Yeah. So essentially, the cool thing about Miniscript is you can like choose what it compiles down to. So you can choose to compile it down to like SegWit v0 or SegWit v1. Uh, I don't know where they are on their v1 support, but I know that that is the intention. Um, okay. Is that you'll be able to take like your existing mini scripts and like have them spit out like optimized taproot scripts. Uh, I see. So basically, you'll you'll say like whatever your normal spending conditions would have been, but it'll be hate a taproot. And it'll but like construct basically. a mast, yeah. and it'll even like based on the probabilities assigned to the different outcomes, like slant the tree to give you the optimal like payout or I guess fees, minimal fees, um, yeah. when you're spending and stuff like oh. that. Yeah, yeah. And as far as a, for an upgrade for wallets that are descriptor based, that'll be a nice straightforward upgrade theoretically once those libraries are upgraded to do that. In theory, yeah, and hopefully in yeah, practice. A lot of well. services these days are, <laughs> are using descriptors, which are a lot of them are built on mini scripts. So yeah, yeah, yeah all this stuff was certainly built with uh, Tappert in mind, and other things, I guess, just generality um, mm -hmm. for the future. So that'll be exciting. Everything works together because it you, because at the end of the day, it's just like some signatures <laughs> when when yeah. it comes to Schnorr, because all the other stuff now is. Kind of elsewhere. That's kind of like my favorite thing about like layer two and other, you know, like point locks and DLCs and escrow contracts and lightning is like all of it is very compatible and you can like put DLCs on lightning channels where you're doing other escrow thingies and you can kind of mix and match everything because at the end of the day they all have the same restriction that you use nothing except for Bitcoin script to describe your resolution. So either your trust model or your uh, whatever it is that you're using to resolve um, any kind of non-cooperation uh, needs to be expressible in just like some signatures and maybe some right, lowest common denominator kind of exactly. Ooh, I, it's like a, a good point. Uh, this is way too nerdy, so it's fine if this goes over people's head. But it's like it's like a principal ideal domain. You have like one element that generates every other ideal. Anyway, we don't. Yeah, but. <laughs> That's all right. That, I've, I've been studying some abstract algebra recently, and it's just at the top of my brain. But so, but you brought up a good point earlier that this is going to all this tap script or tap root stuff is going to require a lot more metadata, most likely be kept because all these the tweaks and the scripts that are behind the scriptless scripts. That's and even stuff just like there. the multiple keys that are now just one key on chain, like you can't use mm -hmm. on chain to back up your three key pieces. If you have three keys, like you need to keep those keys, <laughs> or even like in a t in a traditional in a in a in a, in a multi -sig, multi sig that we have now, you see the public keys that are required to spend. So you can easily easily use those public keys to go find your private keys. But in this new taproot world, you won't have any of that. You'll have That's to know right. for that transaction which private keys you actually need to use. Yeah. So Such there's there's more there's more yeah there, there's more metadata handling and, and things like that that you have to do and especially if it's like a script spend you need to know the mast and where it is on your merkle tree the commitment mm -hmm. to like all the different things because unlike right what you have to do today is you have to just keep track of all the possible things uh, whereas in theory you don't actually have to do that and you just need to keep track of like one tree branch or something um in order to have a backup of a specific 
spend condition for an address or something like this. Um, yeah, so it's it's like there's a lot more you can do, but there's also more kind of off chain handling you need to do because mm -hmm. there's a lot more happening off chain. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is already true for Lightning, where there's a lot of metadata involved That's right. that used to be saved. Now it's just going to be more. It's going to be a similar situation for just a simple, simple non-lightning wallet, on-chain wallet, even. Might That's right. Uh, I mean, assuming it's doing something interesting, though. If you are someone who's just yeah. like coddling and you have a single pub key, it this won't actually affect you. You won't need uh, more metadata, anything like this. It'll be completely normal for those people. It really is just if you're doing other things like multi-sig, like maybe the the biggest affected group would be like people who use multi-sig for cold storage or something. Mm -hmm. But they already have like some minimal amount of metadata they need and now it's just like a little bit more. Um, yeah, they really needed like descriptor information. And we could just make a standard where it's like here is the mask you use for a two of three cold storage and just everyone use that. Like maybe it's not optimal but it's good enough. You're doing cold yeah. storage, you're not yeah. spending this all the time. And then that kind of uh, kernels out the the extra metadata you would need by just having standards. So that's kind of another piece of work that I expect to happen is we're going to have a lot more kind of standards, kind of like we already do with, you know, we have our like BIP39 mnemonic seeds and our BIP, you know, 40, I forget, the, the 32 based wallets with seed derivation that backs up your entire wallet and you have the passwords and you know we have all these different like kind of wallet specifications that kind of reduce the space down to just like oh you just need to back up these 32 words or something so we could add more kind of non-consensus specifications not mm -hmm. blockchain related per se but more like wallet structure standards that will get rid of a lot of this overhead but it hasn't been done yet so it, it looks more daunting than maybe it actually will be for users in the future yeah. Either way, you know, even if wallets have to store a little extra information, it's it's a win, no matter. <laughs> so totally. That's good to see. Yeah. Sorry. Anybody else have questions? I, I've been sort of <laughs> talking a lot. I do. Uh, I'm interested more in, lear in learning more about oracles and using them in the contracts. Uh, is there a good resource just to kind of help me wrap my head around possible applications or what you would need to think about or how how to even go about learning about that? Totally, yeah. So three things pop into my mind. There's uh, shirtbricks.com slash blog. If you look at like the categories on the side and go to discrete log contracts, we've written probably at least a good dozen things just about oracles somewhere in there, or like how you use oracles or, or something like that. Uh, aside from that, that, that might be a bit too broad. There is a GitHub repository called DLC Specs, one word. Um, which has some nice both links to resources and uh, you know the actual Oracle specifications are there uh, and it has examples in the specifications uh, of like how what the Oracle would do and then if you want to like actually like you know do something a little more hands-on there's a piece of software called Crystal Bull um, with a K so K Y R S T U L B U L L um, so it's like a play on crystal ball, I guess. Um, but it's a, a bull. And that is actual Oracle software that you can play around with and actually run. And you can post things to uh, another place, I guess, is oracle.shirdbits.com. You can see what other people are playing around with. I'll drop that one. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, I didn't get that last one, though. Uh, well, I forgot the HTTPS, so <laughs> my bad. But uh, that also has like people, like actual like things that people have generated using Crystal Bull. Um, so you can look at that stuff as well. Um, and then probably Atomic Finance has some blog posts that may or may not be linked on the DLC specs repo. Um, I don't remember if they're there. But if they're not, then Atomic Finance write-ups or Medium or whatever would be another cool place to look because they're actually building some concrete stuff. And they experimented with like a, they had like a Twitter influencer as one side of the bet as like the market makers for a prediction market on like the US election this past year. And that was like all live and executed and stuff. So that is some other cool things that they've done just kind of as proof of concept on chain. Um, yeah. Otherwise, if you have like other questions, there is a Telegram group 
another resource that comes into mind for discrete log contracts. I'm terrible. I don't know what uh, what it's called. It's probably called like discrete log contracts or something. Let me find it for you. Yeah. Um, if anybody has questions too, and you don't want to speak on the recording, feel free to post questions in the chat too. If you totally, well, and then one of us will read them. Uh, I found the t.me for the Telegram group. So here is the DLC Telegram group, and that's just like general audience. You know, anyone can post questions. Like, could you do this with a DLC or Oracle or whatever? Um, and yeah, I'll save these notes, these links, and I'll put them in the meeting notes for today. I mean that. It's on the website for the meeting, so you can get them there too. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I, I clearly uh, could have spent more time on the resources slide, but just put your on such blog, and I was like, I probably written about it. Um, and yeah, but it's nice to have all these things. So, anybody else have questions for Nadav about anything capital related or? Script the scripts, oracles. If not, you can probably find me on Clubhouse on occasion and pass your oh, So we have a question from Tim Dong. He asks, um, so Taproot can help with batching transactions. How does that help? Yeah, so I guess I don't know that Taproot helps specifically with batching transactions beyond how it helps with normal transactions, but Taproot's introduction of Schnorr signatures is uh, like a prerequisite for making really, really nice batch transactions where you just have a single signature for all of the inputs in a single batched transaction. Um, but otherwise, I, I think uh, you know batching transactions before and after Taproot is pretty similar. Um, it's just that in the future, once we have this other soft fork with cross-input signature aggregation, then batching tr transactions will be like the only rational thing to do. Like you will essentially not have to pay for fees for, or you won't have to pay the majority of your fees if you can be included in a batch. Is I think the correct way of putting that. Um, and so people will, for all of their activity, opening channels, sending Bitcoin, doing coin swaps, all of that will essentially also be a coin join <laughs> for everyone all the time. And it'll be cheaper and less on-chain data. So when people ask, how is Bitcoin going to scale, these are the answers. <laughs> oh, yeah, and you found the, the yeah, that's the smart contracts yeah. on-chained. I'll add that to the list. A good, Good old write up. Yeah, great. Uh, Andrew, did you have uh, anything else? Steve, oh. just uh, in case it interests you, because you mentioned L2, I did post to the mailing list a while back about how to simulate what's needed from any prev out to construct L2 channels using smart contracts on chain escrows. So using these escrows that you only use in just few cases to do some very, very minimal stuff that's mostly hidden from them so they don't know what's going on. Um, you can use that little bit of trust to replace uh, the need for a soft fork. Not that it like is better, but like you can do it today in theory. Um, so there's a fun mailing list post on, I guess so it was on the big Lightning, Lightning list? Dev Lightning Dev oh, mailing like, list. Uh, okay. From like I don't remember if it was a year ago or a month ago. Like it's times have been weird recently, but. Um, it's somewhere. I haven't authored too many mailing list posts in the past year. So. I'll find it. Yeah, I'll, I'll look yeah. for that. It's, it's a fun one. I called them skewed uh, lightning channels because it's smart. So this would allow you to use escrow. Okay. So this would allow you to use a different UTXO without. Because isn't that what L two does? L two allows you to use. Or yeah, essentially, uh, what you do different. is you like have this off chain, very simple contract that says that like uh, this lets you or this can spend anything with a lower sequence number or something like that um and but that's all in just the smart contracts on chained contracts that you wrote in like rust or whatever on the side and so it lets you do it, it lets you avoid rebinding by letting you do like dynamic with help from the escrow binding 
Um, okay. And stuff like look that. Look at that email. That you, like, you, yeah. If I recall correctly, you like show that this thing was committed to and that that thing is older. And then you're like, so I should be allowed to spend it this way. And then if your counterparty disagrees, you go to the escrow and then they just do some quick validation and they're like, yep, that checks out. Huh. All right. Interesting. Yeah, I see. I see. Because you're, yeah, in theory, if they agree with you, then you both just resign and you're good. But it's in that one option that they don't agree. This gives you a way out to resolve. Yeah. So like if they just like lost their state and published an old one and are letting you update, like no problem. They'll sign that. It's still cooperative. Mm -hmm. They've just lost data. But if it's like actually non-cooperative and someone's trying to like cheat or something, then you, instead of using any prev out with like their signatures against them, you use a uh, smart contract on chain escrow. But yeah, okay. I guess at a high level, my thesis is like, if you have any solution to the Oracle problem you're comfortable with, I tend to think in terms of like oblivious oracles matched with oblivious escrows where you tweak the outcomes of this and use them here and some other stuff, stuff I work on. Um, then you can write arbitrary contracts. And that includes L2 lightning channels. So I was like, yeah. let's put that into practice. Let's see if that's right. Yeah, um, and that's, yeah, no, that's, that's a good way to think about it. I mean, I, I guess the advantage of L2 is, of course, it's being done by the nodes, so they you don't need an Oracle, but you do need a soft fork. So it's not a... That's right. So yeah, maybe maybe I should write like a thesis, like all soft forks uh, reduced to like smart contracts on chained escrows and right. this means that we should do them because we could do this anyway and it would be a bit more centralized so <laughs> maybe that wouldn't be the best thing or use of my time but that's how i think anyway all yeah, right well thank we have one, i'm sorry i think we have one more question here from adam Hare. Uh, do you think taproot will affect the broader bitcoin adoption or do you think it will stay mainly in the purview of niche users and markets that's a good question. So I think it will certainly affect adoption of Bitcoin in places where the adoption is happening, like on Lightning and things like that, right? So you can imagine, you know, this this will benefit Lightning users, though that is just a small subset today of Bitcoin users. So you know, if you're just here to hodl, this probably won't really affect you, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, unless you want to have some really rigorous cold storage scheme, in which case this will be great for you. Um, but I don't think that that really correlates with adoption. Usually that's like well after adoption. Um, so just in terms of like normal adoption, you know, I probably am not the best person to ask about like what, you know, what gets people into Bitcoin. But um, for, for anyone who's getting into Bitcoin kind of for the use cases that aren't just store of value, so like as a collateral, like the stuff I do with Oracle contracts. So like if you want to do all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer contracting logic or if you want to do instantaneous payments over Lightning or if you want to do kind of these more interesting kind of use cases, the things that draw people oftentimes to non-Bitcoin projects, I think Taproot will make a lot more of those things attractors to those kinds of people as opposed to having them go elsewhere because you can do it all on bitcoin it's just a matter of you have you, you can't do it in not as good ways <laughs> and that makes it harder and taproot makes it easier so that was a long way of saying i hope so <laughs> <laughs> yeah for anybody who wants to be rigorous about their 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 scripts and stuff and Hopefully they'll come to Bitcoin for that. All right. Well, thank you so much Nadal, for questions? your time. Uh, and thanks, yeah, Steve. Thanks for like um, moderating and, and hosting that part. Uh, it was super insightful. I think we learned a lot and um, really cool to see a lot of the different applications that can be built on Schnorr. Uh, but I think we can now move on to the uh, Socratic seminar portion of it.